three-part series. Um, first part covers all the places in Scripture that talk about a three-and-a-half-year timeline, not a seven-year tribulation. And we found that in over eight different places. And then we identified the seals and where they fit in that first timeline. And that study is what produces that chart on the wall. The second part of the series covers just that span in black there, which is the final year talks about the plagues and the trumpets and all the things that are happening leading up to Messiah's return and then we looked in detail at what's happening after Messiah's return from day of trumpeting to the day of tabernacles with the bride in the heavenly sphere and uh had some really good revelations as to the beautiful scriptures that alluded to what is happening during that time with God and his people. So this um, is the third and final part, which talks about all of the scriptures that nobody ever talks about, or if they do talk about it, they put it out of context. They don't realize they're talking about the millennium. And God says, I do nothing unless I reveal my plans through my servants, the prophets. And he has revealed everything from the beginning of creation all the way through the final 7,000th year millennium uh, leading up to a new heaven and a new earth and him dwelling with us. And there's places scattered throughout the Torah and the prophets that allude to what's going to be happening in about during the millennium. But many people don't talk about it because there's so many wrong theories and doctrines and theology about when Jesus comes, everybody goes to heaven and you get a harp. And <laughs> that's what, for, you know, since the dark ages, people have just thought of that. And uh, yet God has revealed Messiah is going to be reigning from Jerusalem as high priest and king. The living Torah is made manifest and he is going to be writing Torah upon our hearts, preparing us for God's new Jerusalem. So... We start with the, the study that we did in Daniel. And remember in the end of Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, um, he saw a rock cut without human hands that's smiting all the kingdoms of the earth and setting up its own kingdom. It says that rock becomes a great mountain in the earth. That's Mount Zion. Other prophecies talk about how Mount Zion and Jerusalem are going to be raised up above all other uh, places and all the rest of the land, like the Araba. The Araba is that land that's around the Dead Sea. It's the lowest land in the world. So it's showing you this context of all the nations are going to be able to see Jerusalem from afar off because it's going to be raised up. That's the mountain that Daniel is referring to. In verse 28 it says, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets, and what shall happen in the latter days? The kingdoms of the past, the kingdoms of iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, they're going to be crushed all at the same time because they become like chaff from the summer threshing floor. Last week we described Armageddon, and we broke down the word into three Hebrew words. And remember it says, gathering them together like heaps of sheaves in a valley for burning. That was literally what the three Hebrew words in, um, in that com are composite of Armageddon made up. So here it's talking about the threshing floor once again. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone, which represents Yeshua, Psalms 22 says, He is the rock of our salvation. And in Hebrew, the word for stone is eben. And you see the olive, bait, and the noon. Olive and bait, the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, are the word for father. And then if you have bait and noon so feet, you have ben, which is son. So even hidden within the Hebrew word for stone, you see father and son together setting up his kingdom. So this eben here, which is Yeshua's kingdom, strikes the statue of the world nations and it becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all the previous kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So this is exciting. We can look forward to this knowing that it's not only going to be a millennium of peace but it's going to be an eternity of peace. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, so this mountain is representing the new Jerusalem in heaven, where Yeshua is currently, and that it broke into pieces the iron, brass, clay, silver, and gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. 
So this is talking about that millennial kingdom. Zechariah 8, 3 says, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. So the very first thing, and you know, when I started uh, writing this series, I was teaching Hebrew roots of Christian faith to a lot of different Christian denominations that had the view that when Jesus comes, we're going to heaven and staying there. And many of them don't have any idea that anything is going to be happening on this earth. So it's very important to start off realizing that he's going to return to Zion and he's going to dwell. It's not just that he's coming to get his people, but he's going to, his kingdom is going to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth because this is where the Prince of Peace is teaching the principles of peace during a thousand years of peace. And it is from the very city of peace. Jerusalem means city of peace. So everything is about peace. And that's why it's called the city of truth where Torah streams from. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Zechariah 14.9 says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and His name one. So right away we can see clearly that the millennium is focused on this earth. Job, amazingly, even though we know that Job was from the time of um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, um, in the book of Job we see Eliphaz being one of the people that's coming to admonish Job and he's a son of Esau. So we know the time frame at which they're living. And even though it was so ancient uh, of times, Job had an understanding of the death and the sleep and the resurrection. And when he rises, he's going to see, the first thing he's seeing is Messiah, his Redeemer. And Job 19.25 uh, talks about the coming of Messiah and the uh, resurrection of the dead in this way, firsthand from Job's perspective. He says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Now some pe groups teach that uh, Messiah's feet will never touch the earth. And so this is completely contradicting that. It says he's going to stand, and we know that, what is that place that he initially stands on? The same place he ascended from, Mount of Olives. So, obviously he's talking about Messiah at his second coming. In Revelation 21 and 22 um, also talk of this. And Job goes on to say, and, through, and though after my skin decays, worms will eat my body, yet in my flesh, so he's saying even though it's going to de decay and the worms are going to eat it, yet in my flesh, just as I am today, shall I see God. So this is pretty amazing. That's his, his way of describing death, decay, sleep, resurrection, and restoration. And he says, in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. So a very beautiful prophecy, even in Job. So the thousand-year millennial reign begins at the seven-day-long Feast of Tabernacles. We know that he comes back on Yom Teruah, the day of trumpeting, and catches up his bride for the wedding and the wedding supper. But the actual kingdom set up upon this earth is when he comes back with all of his Holy One and his feet touch the Mount of Olives on Sukkot. Isaiah 4.5 tells us that God will spread a tabernacle of glory over Jerusalem. So this is a hint at his Shekinah glory dwelling over. Remember how he used to cover Israel with a cloud by day and a fire by night. Interesting that this word tabernacle is actually sukkah when you read Isaiah 4-5 in the Hebrew. So here on the day of tabernacles, he's covering Jerusalem with a tabernacle. According to Zechariah 14-16, the Feast of Tabernacles will also be celebrated each year during the millennium when all nations will ascend to his throne in Jerusalem, bearing tribute to King Messiah and celebrating the festival of Sukkot or booths or tabernacles. These are three words to talk about the same thing. At the end of Zechariah 14, it talks about even the, those that do not come up on Sukkot, no rain will fall on them. This is to teach them that if they're severing themselves from the source of blessing, they're losing blessings by refusing to 
um, follow his instruction at the one period where this is the last chance for you to learn his instruction during the millennium. If you reject it, <laughs> it's one thing to reject it from a human teacher that in the past, but when you're rejecting it from the living Torah himself, imagine the severity of that. And so it talks about specifically Egypt in that context. And then it goes on to talk about the sacrifices that pertain to Sukkot, um, that they will be reenacted during the millennium. Second Peter 3, 8 says, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord uh, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. And we do a study showing even in the seven days of creation, God has put a hidden prophecy in each one of those days that pertain to each millennium throughout history. Day one pertained to what happened in the first thousand years. Day two pertained to what happened in the you know, second uh, millennial day, and so on. Leading up to the Shabbat of rest, it is pointing to the millennial Shabbat. Everything that we do on Shabbat in um, seeking to be holy and to... Um, dwell on God's instruction and to return to his ways and to rest from our work. All of these things are pointing forward to what will be happening during that final thousand years. And like eight turned on its side, which always in mathematics represents infinity, after the seventh millennial day, we are truly entering into eternity because it's at the end of the millennium that sin and death are destroyed. So this is the very final cycle that the weak creation pointed to. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says, And the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. In Hebrew, that's Sar Shalom. And Eternal Father is actually Avi Ad. And it's interesting because, you know, Avi is like my father, but Ad is the Ayan and the Dalit. This letter here, the ayin and the dalit, they are the two letters that are enlarged in the Shema that talk about God is Echad. So when you say Shema, that's Shin Mem Ayin. That ayin is enlarged at the beginning of the Shema. When you get down to Echad at the end of the Shema, the Dalit is enlarged. That's another one of those anomalies. So basically, it's talking about the eternal witness of the Father. Here it's referring to the Son. Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government. This is just exactly what Daniel was saying. There's no end to his government, his kingdom, or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. So very beautiful to see how this wasn't just in one place in the scriptures that it's referring to this kingdom. It's in multiple places. Isaiah 14, 5 and 7 says, The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. And why does it refer to this period as a time of quietness? Because Satan is bound from deceiving the nations any longer. See, right now, every time we get a little seed of truth planted in our heart, who's there ready to tear it out and to cloud it and to make you question it and deceive you and to take you away from it. But at that time, we can learn unadulterated without these constant um, batterings of uh, deception. So let's look at Satan being bound. Isaiah 24, 21, many people think of this as only a New Testament concept in Revelation, but I always try to show what John and what the different disciples what they were referencing in the Old Testament. So it's nothing new. The New Testament just confirms the Old Testament. Isaiah 24, 21, and 22 says, In that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above. So remember, we are fighting a war of principalities and powers to be. This is talking about the spiritual warfare of the demonic uh, angels. So he's going to punish. The powers in the heavens is referring to the fallen angels. And the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together, another reference to this, you know, bringing them together, like a heap of sheaves. Whenever you would um, sift wheat, you would have a big pile of tares, and you would burn them, usually in the valley. So here they're being heaped together, or herded together, like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. So this is a reference, even in Isaiah's time, 800 BC, that... They're going to be shut up for a time, so they're not 
totally destroyed yet, their punishment comes after. And this confirms or is uh, congruent with Revelation that talks about Satan and his angels being bound for a thousand years, and then he's released for a little season. And what does he do? First thing he does is try to turn people and deceive again against the kingdom. And uh, then it says, He is thrown in the lake of fire, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, along with sin and death. That's the final cleansing of the earth by fire at the end of the thousand years. So this is what Isaiah was referring to. Revelation says the same thing. John sees an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, also known as Hasatan, which means the adversary, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss. See, this is the prison that this is referring to. And shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Anybody have a question? So, one of the beautiful things I like to show in the prophecies pertaining to the millennium is how Israel and all Jews will recognize Mashiach when he comes. Sometimes Christians have this focus that they have to convert the Jews and the prophecies say that when they see him, the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out upon them and they will recognize him and they will mourn. <laughs> mourn as one mourns for a firstborn son. Because they, so, because they didn't know. They didn't recognize. For whatever reason, they were allowed to have a veil until the fullness of the Gentiles. Why does it say the fullness of the Gentiles? Anybody know? What's so important about the fullness of the Gentiles? These Gentiles, which you think are pagan nations are actually containing descendants of the lost house of Israel. Exactly. That's why Yeshua says, I go, <laughs> I come from the lost house of Israel. The message of Messiah was supposed to go out to all the world. It was prophesied already. Jews will recognize it when he comes. But they had to have a veil so that that rejection would allow it. Otherwise, they would have kept it. And it would have just been uh, theirs and theirs alone, in essence. You know, This is our Messiah. It's not for the world. Not realizing that from 722 B.C., the northern ten tribes of Israel had dispersed up uh, through Assyria, become the Parthenon uh, nation, gone up into Europe. And then uh, when they started being persecuted in um, Europe... In the 1400s, late 1400s, the Al Hamburg Decree was the final law that um, kicked the Jews out of Spain. And that's when God opened up the new world for the freedom to worship the Torah and uh, have religious liberties. Yes, Danny? I was just wondering, their jealousy about you know, seeing those people who weren't people worshiping the Lord the way they should be doing it kind of... Spark them to, you know, what are they doing? What God can, <laughs> yeah, use everything. He says in the end, Ephraim's um, envy of Judah and Judah's jealousy of Ephraim. Does everybody get why that is? Ephraim is another word for the northern house of Israel. And they envy, because our Jewish mm -hmm. brothers in yeah. Judah, they preserved the Torah. We're Ephraim over here in America, right? Descendants of the northern house. And we have envied everything that Israel has had. They preserved the Torah. They're living in the land. We have this envy because we're zealous for it when our hearts turn back to Torah. But we've had great wealth, protection, prosperity. In that way, Judah is jealous of Ephraim. What we're doing in Israel on this trip is reconciling the two houses back together in fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. Yes. Um. Yeah, it seems like we who have been called out are going to be something that is going to wake up those people who are of Jerusalem or Jew, who are Jews, because they're going to see what we have, and they don't have it right now. They talk <laughs> about their faith as a religion more. Mm -hmm. on the American station of Judas right. broadcasting. And so I see us being prepared and coming forth and bringing uh, Yeshua to them in a way and observing the Sabbath 
and the holidays yes as we're supposed to and it's going to make them hungry for it well that's our holiday <laughs> <laughs> yeah we Hopefully. have to live it even more righteously than theirs not adding to it or not subtracting exactly. from it and yet without trying to convert or push uh, just to be a light by example exactly yes Steve Paul alludes to that I think it's chapter 11 of Roma, uh, Romans where it says that um, you know has God given up on Jew the Jews no absolutely uh, not on, on <coughs> Israel but uh, and then he goes on saying and then Jews will to be saved them to jealousy yes uh, he's done this you know, yes. that's right we will never provoke them to jealousy or um, cause anyone to recognize Messiah if we're promoting a false Messiah you know either a, a secondary God or somebody who does away with Torah or anything that has the paganism of the world they, that is not going to be attractive um, or enticing so we have to know God's instruction know the Torah return to Torah ourselves there's a great work for Ephraim to do as much as a work for Judah to do and so the main thing like I always say we have to look at ourselves instead of looking at others and live it and allow the spirit to the spirit of truth to shine through us did you have something Archie that you yeah, want to read? It says in the <coughs> Isaiah, chapter 11 verse 13 the, env the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and yes. the of Yehuda shall be cut off Ephraim shall not envy Yehuda. Yehuda shall not vex Ephraim. That's when we could become one and we're unified. Yeah. Guess what? The power of God miraculously attends unification. When the whole house of Israel is together, we can win any battle. We can overcome any sin. And the Shekinah glory will dwell amongst us. And it was dwelling amongst us as long as we were unified. And when we were divided at the time of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, that's when the Shekinah left. And it's never been back. Why? Because the two houses have not come back together if we will come back together God is just waiting to pour out his Shekinah glory on us again very exciting Zechariah 12 10 says and I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications and they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and they shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn beautiful poetic description Zechariah 13 6 says and one shall say to him what are these wounds in your hands then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends see no condemnation he's not even thinking negative just like I was talking about the high priest never thinks negative about the whole house of Israel he doesn't even share it in a negative light like that was when your forefathers did this that were trying to maintain power and control you know he doesn't go there right. and that's a good example for us today somebody does us wrong they ask us about it or maybe there's an opportunity for forgiveness we don't bring up you know like the old saying goes you bury the hatchet and leave the handle sticking out <laughs> you just don't go there you show unconditional love and that's what he's saying he's like yeah I got wounded in the house of my friends you know it's such a positive way to say it it's just beautiful and it's prophesied that Israel will be found righteous and saved. Isaiah 45, 21 and 24 through 25 says, Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the yod heh vav -He? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. So the Word made flesh is not a separate God. We should never promote a triune God. His word the way he's veiling his glory because we have too much darkness to even be in the proximity of his full glory so he's literally veiling himself his word in human flesh as an implement to enact salvation and that's what uh, Yeshua is in that way there's only one God and he is a righteous God and he is a savior they will say of me in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength all who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. But in the Lord, all the descendants of Israel will be found righteous and will exalt. That is so beautiful. That's what that process of the millennium is for. Where we haven't refined our characters, where we haven't been sanctified enough, where we're not living without sin perfectly or living out the Torah in our lives, Yeshua is going to teach us by example how to do that. That's why it takes a thousand years. It's a big job he has. <laughs> but this is the good news we will be found righteous and we will exalt Romans 11 26 Rabbi Shaul is saying the same thing all Israel will be saved just as it is written and then he quotes it the deliverer will come from Zion he will remove ungodliness from Jacob 
This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Um, back on that previous one. Uh-huh. You have the word, will exalt. Right? Right here, yes. Right. Future the, tense. My understanding, is, my understanding is when you use the you, it's ex exaltation. It's just the slightest shape higher than the other. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. And it makes me realize, you know, once again, we're not talking about something done in the past. It's not historical. This is future tense. The future. There are certain scenes in Revelation that show the saints singing the song of Moses. And the way that we identified what Armageddon meant, remember that word arm? Uh, there's, it's only used once in Torah, and it was in the song of Moses. And it shows how the saints, God's people in the end days, will be righteous. How they will have had the victory over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. It says that they held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. So here you see two elements here. You see the glory to God but also why the song of the Lamb? Because we're claiming the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Great and marvelous are your deeds Lord God Almighty. So just like Moses sang this when he was delivered from uh, Pharaoh's armies in Egypt and went through the Red Sea. We're going to go through the tribulation like they went through the tribulation, like they went through the Red Sea, and we're going to look back and see the deliverance of our God, and we're going to sing His praises. Not only the deliverance to keep us safe, but to atone for our sins, deliverance from sin, and becoming victorious. He says, Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will now come and bow before you. See, this is a little reference to the millennium. Now that you've delivered us from the false system of the world, Babylon, that's why one of the last things that happens is the fall of Babylon. The cities of the earth have to fall so that we can see God exalted and we say, now the nations can come and worship before you. Because as long as man is in power, there's no way the nations are going to come and learn truth. But when Messiah is reigning and his kingdom is over the earth it gives the freedom for the nations to leave their selfish um, false system and to come seek his ways it says for your righteous acts have been revealed then we see a picture of a great multitude in revelation 7 8 through 10 all wearing white robes indicative of their characters being refined and made righteous John says, After this I looked, and there was before me a great multitude that nobody could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. So one of the times of year that we have palm branches in our hand is... Feast of Tabernacles. So it's very fitting that this is a picture of right at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom because it happens in the fall time. Question. Oh, yes. Before. Yeah, exactly. How literal do you take holding palm branches in their hands? You always have to look in the context of right. the text. When Definitely. it's talking about a nation symbolically, it'll yeah. use beast. Um, if it's talking more literally, it'll say nation. So this is a more literal text, and it's referencing the fall time of... Um, right. Yeah, the whole... If you look at it even more literally, it's when they were actually holding it in their hands. During the week, do they hold it in their hands? There's a certain day that they hold it in their hands. When they're building it, when they're taking it down. Uh-huh. Fair? Yeah. That's it. great. I don't know. Just... That's wonderful. But Even living out the Torah, making sukkahs, and he says, I'm going to spread a sukkah of glory over Jerusalem in that day. Imagine everybody fulfilling yeah. Sukkot. You've come back to a pretty much wasted world. <laughs> you know, it's had 100-pound hail hitting it for 15 days. Um, it's had huge earthquakes that are dividing the land and fire and uh, brimstone. And here, you, what is a sukkah but a temporary dwelling? Yeah. 
See, we're going to build more permanent dwellings in, as we have more time, but the very first thing that you're going to do, you're yeah. still going to observe Sukkot and uh, be staying in temporary dwellings, which is really neat. And with 100-pound hail, he's still going to provide the palm branches. Yeah. <laughs> if you go ahead and you read off the next verse, these are the ones who came out of the Great Tribulation. That's right. The ones who rode white in the mud of the year. That's right. That's what it says. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the Great Tribulation. They have washed their robes, representing characters, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's why they're singing the Song of Moses. They're so thankful that He gave us the power to be overcomers. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they serve Him day and night in His temple. So this is amazing. Even though they're a huge multitude, the reason they're a huge multitude, it's not that there's so many people that are living righteously in the last days. Those that are alive are called a remnant. There are a few leftovers, just like a remnant of fabric on a bolt of fabric. So the great multitude has to be those resurrected that have lived righteously throughout the ages, throughout all of Earth's history. That's why, because look at how special their mission is. They get to serve God in the throne. I mean, basically in His temple day and night. And He who sits on the throne will spread His sukkah over them. So another reference to that time of year. Yeah. Never again will they hunger and never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor so uh, scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Jeremiah 37 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Yaakov's trouble. But he, speaking of Jacob's descendants, all of Israel, once again, will be saved by reason of it. Why does God allow tribulation? It brings our heart to repentance, to teshuva. And so here he's literally saying that through this tribulation, it's drawing their heart closer to God in repentance. And by so doing, they're going to be saved by reason of it. It's actually a helping agent. Just like the refiner's fire, you could look at it as being a harmful, destro destroying effect. But what does it do? It doesn't burn up the gold. It only burns up the dross. So what is left is the pure gold, of, which is representing Messiah's character in us. So then there's an interesting prophecy in Ezekiel that many people, you know, you never will hear this preached about in all of the, the world. But um, like I said, when the saints return from the marriage and the marriage supper of the Lamb in the heavenly sphere, they're coming back to a decimated earth. The last thing that happened before we were caught up was the sixth plague of Armageddon. And so you have a tremendous amount of wicked uh, people who were intent on destroying God's people that now their bones are littering the surface of the earth. And vehicles of warfare that are just sitting, lying there, um, why bones on the surface of the earth? There's another place that says the earth will not disclose her dead. See, there was no time for burying any of them. And when God is having a marriage supper for those that were a part of the wedding of the Lamb, Ezekiel talks about there was a feast on this earth that the vultures took part in. And it says they ate the flesh of kings and captains. These are those that were intent on destroying God's people in Israel and dividing the land. And so it's their bones that are littering the surface of the earth. And Ezekiel says that there will actually be people allotted to this specific work. Not everybody can have this work because it makes you unclean, cleaning up the bones, but there's a period of time that somebody will have this job and then they will be cleansed after it. And it takes them seven months to clean up all of these bones. And there's a certain place where they will be buried. Ezekiel describes it like this in vision. Behold, it comes. Speaking of that day, the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall be done. It's great for us, terrible for them, for the wicked. 
says the Lord, yod heh vav -Hey, This is the day whereof I have spoken, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, and shall kindle fire, and burn weapons, and shields, and targets, and bows, and arrows, and hand staffs, and spears. What he's describing here are implements of warfare, in the best way he could describe, because he didn't know how to describe modern technology. So all the things that are used, you know, whether it's Tomahawk missiles, or whether it's, um, what do you call those big helicopters? Yeah. Um, Apache, Apache, Apache helicopters, Black Hawk, yeah, all of these type of things, tanks, um, all of these things you could just implement. He's using descriptive words from his day for implements of warfare. He says, for seven years, there's not going to be any wood needing to be burned because we're burning the fuel that's left over from all these vehicles of warfare. No wood shall be taken out of the field, neither cut down out of the forest, for they shall make fire with the weapons. And they shall spoil those who spoiled them, and plunder those who plundered them. Because all of the wealth of the nations, what have they done? They brought it yep. to come against Jerusalem, and there it is. Now that's how it says in Zechariah 14, that that which was taken from you is now going to be divided amongst you, basically given back. He says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place for burial in Israel. So Gog is a symbolic term for the nations that come against Israel. The valley of the passerbys is what it's called, to the east of the sea. So, which sea is this? That's what we have to ask. A lot of times it'll talk about the Mediterranean as the Great Sea in prophecy. It'll talk about the Dead Sea as the sea that is um, east of Jerusalem. And it shall stop the way of the passerbys, and there they shall bury Gog and all the multitude, and they shall call it the Valley of Haman Gog. So this is seven years for the weapons, but there's seven months just for the bones. Isaiah 66, 24 speaks of that. It says, Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me. And this is what you're doing. You're looking at all of the corpses of those who have transgressed against God. Ezekiel 39 goes further in describing it. It says, Seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them, that they may cleanse the land and all the people of the land, and shall bury them. And it shall be to them for renown in the day that I shall be glorified, says the Lord, yod heh vav -Heh. And they shall sever out men of continual employment to go through the land, who with the passerby... The passers-by shall bury those that remain upon the face of the land to cleanse it. So there's a process of cleansing even. Do you see how everything is cause and effect? And many people just think of when Messiah returns, everything's miraculously, <coughs> poof, made perfect, right? If that was the case, you wouldn't have any need for cleansing the land. There's gonna, he's going to show us. And what that's doing, even in the millennium, that's teaching us. If you're going and picking up a bone, or you're seeing the results, like Romans 6.23 literally comes to life, the wages of sin is death. More and more, what God wants us to realize is any way that we deviate from His selfless love, all self-seeking ends in self-destruction. And we have to get that principle so deeply in our minds so that when sin is finally destroyed at the end of the millennium, we never want to even think about dabbling in any area of self-gratification, self-exaltation, self-aggrandizement, um, you know, um, self-glorification, because we realize how heinous sin is. It always leads to death. And so even by cleaning up, cleansing the results of sin, it's having a huge impact on our sanctification. Yes? Um, on TV this week, they had this very famous lady, and she put it in such a way that I, it just stunned me. She says, are you moving in to his light? Amen. Or are you moving out? Away from it. It's so simple and yet so profound. Because... Yeah. That's what I used to tell the children in uh, Russia when I would go into the communistic schools. And, you know, you're trying to simplify things, especially through translation. And if you can make kids realize that every choice, it boils down to every choice in life. And it's really so simple. One leads to self. Is it for me and the self alone? Or is it selfless? Is it for the good of others and to the glory of God? This is going to determine whether you remain under that blanket of protection and you receive the blessings that God wants to bless you with and whether your life is even more abundantly. I was telling them how serving God is the greatest adventure there is in life. 
and many kids want a great adventure when they get out of school, but they're thinking, oh, that spiritual stuff, that religiosity, because all they've seen is the religion of men, especially in Russian Orthodox or Roman Catholicism and all of these things. It looks burdensome. It's man-made. If you can show that living for God is the greatest adventure there is, and it's so freeing, it's not burdensome at all, and we can determine our destiny by every little choice. Is it for myself or is it selfless love that I'm exhibiting? And in that way, like she said, we're either moving into the light or moving away from the light. It's really simple. It is. I think we overcomplicate the simple <laughs> principles of God, and theologians have done it for thousands of years. So then it says, uh, at the end of the seven months, they're going to make a search, a final search. Is the land um, good enough to be called cleansed? Is there any bone that you missed? And this is the way they're going to do it. The passerbyers, um, so what, what are they? There's a highway of holiness. And all the nations stream to Jerusalem to learn of God and learn of His Torah from Messiah on this highway. So there's people passing through these valleys, coming up, streaming up to Jerusalem. <laughs> if somebody's coming from one of their nations, excuse me, <coughs> and they happen to see a bone... Then when they get to Jerusalem, they say, oh, who should I talk to about, uh, I was at such and such location, and it says, when any man sees a bone, he shall set up a sign by it. I posted this little marker, this little flag, if you will, and um, it remains there. They go to Jerusalem, they tell the people who are allotted to go and bury it. The barriers come, oh, we missed one, and then they go and take it to the Valley of Ham and Gog. So it's very literal, very logical, very cause and effect. Pretty amazing. And no one is teaching on these things. Yeah. And yet he's intended for us to know these beautiful things that are going to happen. So after cleansing the land, Yeshua turns the dry wastelands surrounding Jerusalem back into a garden. It's prophesied through Isaiah, chapter 51, verse 3, that God shall comfort Zion. He shall comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness again like Eden. And her desert, and down south of Israel, it starts to become very deserty. It's called the Negev, and there's big crater lands in it, and nothing's growing there. It's just rock and dust, and looks like some place on the moon. But her deserts will become like the Garden of Yahava. And we see how rich that soil actually is. It's just, there's a lack of blessing on the land because there's still sin in the land. Rain is always a symbol of when you're living in harmony with God's ways, you're blessed by rain for all your land. Remember when Elijah rebuked Ahab for having this illicit relationship with Jezebel and because he wouldn't turn in repentance, there was no rain on the land. He says, if you do not repent, there'll be no rain on the land. And how long did that time of trouble for Israel last? Three and a half years exactly, it's described. Another type pointing to the final tribulation. So, when the people are returned back to God's ways, the rains return as a sign of God's blessing. I like it in the Shema. I will provide the early and the late rain. Yeah, that's right. If you do these things. But if you don't... <laughs> yep, this is what's coming. It's right there. He wants us to know the cause and effect so we exactly. can make the right choices because you will never usurp our will. God is a God of love and freedom in such a way that he allows us the freedom of choice even to the place where it's killing him to see us destroying ourselves but that's called his strange act that he will still allow you to destroy yourself he will do everything he can including manifesting himself and being a sacrifice to atone for your sins and to take that cause and effect but if you don't accept him and you choose in the rebelliousness of your heart to continue to um, to live apart from him Romans 1 says, this is the wrath of God to allow you to be given over to the lust of your heart and receive the cause and effect of your choices. And that shows how much freedom he's given. Even you can see it from angelic times with Satan. In the heavenly sphere, Lucifer had to start thinking a wrong thought. I want to be like God. Nothing wrong with that. We're created to be like God, right? But how do you think God came to receive worship? That's the key difference. Did he exalt himself? 
Mm-hmm. Or was it because he's so selfless that he can't help but infuse light and life to all things? So his light and life is creating things, and he creates the angels, and they worship him because this selfless love is emanating out from him like light. And Satan misunderstands this, and he says to himself, I'm going to exalt myself, so I'll receive worship, then I'll be like God. Wrong principle. One's started in selflessness, one's started in selfishness. And so he could have eradicated Hasatan or Lucifer right then and there, knowing his thoughts, or even when he started to deceive the other angels towards this agenda, if he was that kind of God. But the fact is, he's not that kind of God. He could have, some people say, well, he didn't want the other angels to worship him out of fear, you know. But he's an all powerful God. He could have erased their memory of him. So that's not the real reason why he didn't destroy him. It's because he doesn't even push himself. He's going to allow sin to destroy itself. He's never going to be the destroyer. He's the life giver. He says about the destroyer, you are of your devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. So Yeshua is clearly identifying God as a God of life. And he gives the free choice even to his angelic sphere to rebel against him as well as man. This reveals something so beautiful about the character of God. He doesn't even have to usurp his creation's will. Isaiah 41, 18 says, I will open up rivers on the bare heights and foundations in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness into a pool of water and the dry land into water springs. I will give in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the cleaster. I will set in the desert the cypress, the pine, the box tree together that they might see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of Yahavah has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. I'm going to shut this window a little bit because we're getting some wind. Then one of the prophecies that I like to bring out is how when all these things are being restored and the wastelands have been cleansed and they're being made like a garden, Jerusalem is raised up while all the other land around it is lowered down to, uh, to a lower position. See, it's not just maintaining its regular elevation. When it talks about the Arabah, it's talking about below sea level. So uh, Zechariah 14.9 says, and the yod heh shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one yod heh and his name one. So if we understand that Mashiach is going to be king over all the earth, and Yesh- Mashiach is the word of the yod heh made manifest, then this is how Zechariah could say this, referring to God Almighty, because it is a part of himself that is just like the seed of men you know, produces a child when it is planted into something. The Word of God is likened unto a seed in the parable of the sower and the seed. So literally, this is God's DNA that He has placed into Mary. This is the seed that is now going to be king over the earth, and and that's a part of Him. uh, Verse 10 says, All the land from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, shall be turned as the Arabah, the flat plain around the Dead Sea. And Jerusalem shall be lifted up and shall dwell in her own place. So, it's hard to find uh, something that could be a good example. I always try to find a picture uh, to represent these different scriptures that we're bringing out. But uh, you can imagine seeing some place that just has... um, Right now, Jerusalem is about 3,000 feet above the Dead Sea. And uh, imagine it being heightened even more, and the rest of the land lowered even more. It's going to look like some kind of big, severe type mountain. So I just use this as a little example. It's supposed to be 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 15. That's the New Jerusalem. Oh, that's the New Jerusalem. So that's after the millennium. Okay. Yeah. Then God's New Jerusalem will descend from heaven, and it will take up that much space. You're exactly oh, yeah. right. <laughs> Beautiful, huh? Yeah. yeah. You know that's so big it can't fit anywhere on earth. <laughs> and then there's prophecies that talk about Mashiach rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. So, whatever temple we call the third temple, if the, our Jewish brothers actually um, accomplish rebuilding it before Mashiach's coming, that is not the temple that Mashiach is going to inhabit. It'll be the location, but 
um, that one's going to be destroyed because it talks about Jerusalem and the Temple Mount being split into three by the great earthquake. And of course, then we see how the whole Jerusalem changes topography. It's being raised up. So whatever they build, if they even accomplish it, and I'm not saying it has to be accomplished to fulfill all prophecy, but if they fulfill it, it will be a place that the Antichrist inhabits, um, if anything. But it is prophesied that Yeshua, the Messiah, will build his own temple in the millennial reign. Ezekiel 37, verse 26 says, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant, and I will place them and multiply them, and I'm going to set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Jeremiah speaks of this this way. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwelling places, and the city will be rebuilt. Why? Because it, it, along with the fall of Babylon, was pretty much destroyed. So when we start the millennium, it needs to be rebuilt. It'll be rebuilt in its ruin and the Temple Mount. So what's interesting in the Hebrew... Um, it's Armon, which means like an elevated palace. Now the king lives in a palace, the high priests officiate in a temple. So oftentimes you'll hear the temple referred to as an Armon, which is like uh, the armory or the exalted palace of the king. It's gonna have two, he's gonna be reigning with two offices, high priest and king. So thus the temple becomes not only his palace, but it becomes his house or his home. And that's why it talks about the house of the Lord. You heard the temple re being referred to as the house of the Lord, because that's the dwelling place of both the high priest and the king. And he says, and it will stand on its rightful place. So whatever is built there now, remember what God says to do to the pagan high places? Destroy them. That's right. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13 says, then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is. Where is he? He's in the heavens now. He's going to branch out from there, and he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple. So he's creating a double witness for himself right here in this one verse by saying it twice. It's like, verily, verily, I say unto you, that was always creating a double witness, truly, truly. And so he says, yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. So once again, it's likening a dual office. The temple's for the high priest, but you sit and rule. The priest never sat. Do you know that in the ta tabernacle? Only a king sits. Mm -hmm. So once again, it's showing a hidden element of high priest and king. Amos 9, verses 11 and 15 says, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David. What day? The seventh day. It's a millennial day. Yeah, the 7,000th year. In that day, which is right after the day of the Lord, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the branches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it again as in the days of old. They that may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen, which are called by my name. So there's going to be people from Palestine. That's what Edom represents. And from the other heathen nations, wherever they are, there's going to be people, and we already know them, that are turning not just to Christianity, but they are turning to truth. They're turning to Torah. And they are giving their hearts, recognizing Yeshua. They are also keeping, desiring to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua, which is beautiful. If people will repent, no matter where they're from, God has a place for them. He says, they are called by my name, says the Lord that does this. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine. So what that's saying is no longer is there anybody to minister to, to plant seeds of truth into. You're only seeing the harvest. You're not having to go and try to teach any longer or convert any longer. It's just harvesting. Everybody's ripe and ready. Um, yeah, it's good. <laughs> he says, um, the harvest is plenty, but the workers, workers are, are few. few. I will bring again 
the exiles of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. So this is a messianic prophecy, I mean a millennial prophecy about the restoration. And they're going to also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, says the Lord thy God. Beautiful. Micah. I like to show, you know, it's not just in one place or just one prophet. Here we're looking at Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Amos, Micah. Because people don't realize, uh, so many people have never had a real heart to read through the prophets, whether they're major prophets or minor prophets, and yet they have had so many hidden prophecies contained within them. They weren't only speaking to Israel in their day, but many prophets, the way God speaks through them in such an enigmatic way, it has dual application for both their time frame and for the future uh, millennial kingdom as well. He says, many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. So all these nations are streaming up to the temple. And uh, to the house, another word for temple, of the God of Jacob. So it's not just any religion that is reigning. This is very clear that this is the temple of the God of Jacob. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He will teach us his ways. This is the whole purpose of the millennium. And we will walk in his paths. For the Torah shall go forth from Zion. So the main reason is the teaching of Torah. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returned. This is now Zechariah speaking in Zechariah 1.16. I am returned to Jerusalem with mercy, and my house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a lion shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. So how could this be referring to a millennium in heaven? You know, there's so much that talks about a literal Jerusalem and needing to repair it. If it was in heaven, everything would be perfect. There's no need for repairing anything. This is very clear that this is after the tribulation and after things have been destroyed. These things are being restored so that Yeshua can teach Torah from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Acts 15, 16 says, After these things I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which is fallen and will rebuild its ruins and set it up, so that the residue of men may seek out Yahavah and all the nations on wh whom my name is evoked, says Yahavah, who does these things. And the very name, the reason why it says they're called by his name, is because when you understand his name and the pronunciation of it, it literally has other words hidden within that yod heh vav -Hey that come out that mean self-existent father of selfless love. And that's what's so beautiful. That's really what motivates and woos the heart. All the preaching on the punishment of hell if you don't repent, or the reward of heaven if you, uh, you know, obey, none of those are true motivators. Fear of punishment or reward never have been true motivators. The only true motivator in life, and this is a good lesson for us as parents and teachers, is love. That's what woos the heart, and that's what motivates us for change. And then it... There's prophecies that talk about him reigning in the dual office. Matthew 25, 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then shall he sit down upon his throne of glory. Jeremiah 3, 17 says, At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of yod heh vav -Heh, And all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of yod heh vav -Heh, to Jerusalem, and they shall no more walk after the stubbornness of their evil hearts. Yeah. Isn't that great? There's going to be a heart change. Yeah. That's what the new covenant is all about. People claim the new covenant say, I'm not under the law, I'm under the new covenant. Mm -hmm. And what is the new covenant? If we've read it, we know that it's for the house of Israel and the house of Jacob. Mm -hmm. So you definitely want to be grafted into one of those two houses because the new covenant's only for them. Mm -hmm. And then it says, and I will write Torah upon your heart. Yeah. What he's doing, he says, I'm going to give you a circumcised heart. He's going to make it like baby skin again so that we have that desire, like a little child desires to please their parents. We're not going to any longer be walking after the stubbornness of our evil hearts. <laughs> We're going to be so eager to please Abba, Father, and to return to his ways. And no longer do we have to keep this guard up and this filter. You know, all my life I've had to listen or learn with a filter, gauging like a good Berean, everything according to the Word of God. But when it comes from the mouth of Mashiach, 
imagine just being able to like receive the fire hose you know yeah. you don't have to have any filter on you're just like yes whatever you say we will do just like Israel said at the base of Mount Sinai yeah. it's going to be so refreshing just to receive and not have to worry about is that really truth huh, I wonder if there's an element of error in there like we always do now Ezekiel 43 7 says and he said to me son of man the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile that's beautiful you know Ezekiel is great from chapter yeah. 40 through 48 Anytime you're reading those chapters, you can automatically tell yourself, this is talking about the Millennial Temple. Those eight chapters, nine chapters, are all focused on the Millennial Reign. Zechariah 6, 12 through 13 says, He will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. So here Zechariah even very clearly says he's holding two offices. Now in the past, Jews were looking for two different messiahs. Because of these prophecies, and they didn't understand the chronology of in time events, they said, okay, we see two Mashiachs here. One has to be a king, and one has to be a high priest. Two different men, same coming, one coming. It was just the opposite, in fact. One man, two different comings. And he's going to hold two offices. So then there's a beautiful prophecy talking about even though you might not know which tribe you're from, you know you're from the lost house of Israel. There's a reason why your DNA is waking up for a return to Yah's ways and to learn his Torah. And yet you don't know which tribe you're particularly, your family was from. But God knows. And he's going to return you to the land that was given as an inheritance for that tribe. In the millennial reign, you're actually going to live with your tribal people. And God will reveal that where you're going to live. Go ahead. Well, we, you know, we talked about it on a number of occasions. It's like there's a veil over people's eyes and they're, the choices they're making are, why can't they see yes. the events that are going on today? It, 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 you're, you're amazed. I mean, people that you know, you, you're, you're almost pleading with them. Yeah. To open their eyes, mm -hmm. and it's it's as if there's a veil, and I and I often uh, we've talked about it many times about is it simply the lineage, the book of life, if you will, mm -hmm. and and all of a sudden your eyes are opened and their eyes are, are shut, and yet sometimes it even happens within a family, so it's a spiritual yeah. issue as well as a DNA issue. It's not only because. Like, remember, you should talk to those who would claim, well, we're sons of Abraham, you know? And he says, if you were sons of Abraham, you would recognize me. So it's a spiritual issue. One time, one sibling can return to Torah, and the other sibling chooses to live a selfish life for themselves and to compromise returning to God's ways because it would cut his income, stopping working on Shabbat, or it's an inconvenient truth, or it's not fit with my lifestyle. And so here, like Dave says, we're so excited to share the good news because it's like you know you're, somebody has won the lottery ticket. Imagine how you would be so excited, even though you don't get a dime, to go share with somebody that they won the lottery, right? That's the way we feel about sharing this good news with people. Do you know who you are? Do you know what your lost identity is? Do you know what's in store for you? You get to receive the inheritance. And do they want to hear it? That's the spiritual issue. Whether they have spirit, because spiritual things are spiritually, spiritually discerned. I was just sharing with somebody about the tribes and the two houses, and they're like, well, we're all from Adam anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Isn't it sad? They minimize it. They <laughs> minimize it. And they're blessing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's so true. But <laughs> maybe, just like so many, they will come to a knowledge of it later on. We never know when somebody is ready. Sometimes maybe just what you said there, they weren't ready to di fully digest, but you at least planted the seed. And in that way, you're a worker for the kingdom uh, because later they'll say, you know, there was some truth to what she said and let me research it more, yeah. And we often don't see the result of our the seeds that are planted. There's a, a watering that the spirit has to do to, to germinate them in the fertile soil of the heart. You just mentioned uh, like a uh, hunger or something, a word that touched on hunger. And I was just thinking along those lines <coughs> that, um, you know, spiritual hunger works the opposite of physical hunger. Yes. Because when you're empty. That's when uh, you're truly spiritually you're, heightened. You're, you're, you're hungry when you're physically. Mm -hmm. and when you're physic, when you're spiritually, um, 
when you're spiritually hungry, that means that you are you have to some extent been filled. Yes. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst and after righteousness for my sake. The, 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 that, that people get to a point where they're just so satisfied, they just basically uh, stop being hungry. hungry. And that's why God allows the prosperity to be taken away, so that then, once we deny the flesh, then it gives opportunity for the spirit to be fed. But the two d don't go hand in hand. If you're constantly feeding and gratifying the flesh, then the spirit is going to suffer. So that's why Yeshua fasted regularly, and then the spirit would, could be fed. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, speaking of physical food alone, but by every word, which is the spiritual food that proceeds from the mouth of God. Good points. You know, and that's what I love about, even though the topic is on the millennium, the Holy Spirit takes us on beautiful tangents of truth into different areas that speak to our heart. It's all truth. Ezekiel um, 47 talks about how God is going to give us the inheritance in the land, just like we said the Birkat Hamazon after the meal, thanking Him for the good land which we're going to receive. Every time we eat uh, food, we have to remember that He has given us a land that's going to produce great food, and we have an inheritance there. Verse 21 says, You shall divide this land unto yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. Now, remember what I said about Ezekiel? Anything past 40 is speaking of the millennial age and the millennial temple. So this is pertaining to that time period. Some people have the question, how do you know? Well, you know, it's the whole context. We're not just reading a verse. When you read all the way from 40 to 48, it's talking about a temple that has never been built in the past. So it's not historical. And uh, so in the context of that, here this prophecy comes out. It shall come to pass that when you divide the land by lot for an inheritance unto you, what did, why did they take lots back in biblical days? To see what God's will was. So what it's doing, it's not magic and it's not games of chance, but this is a way for God to reveal, okay, what is your inheritance? What tribal inheritance do you have? And where do you belong? And all of these things. So you take lots for an inheritance. And to the stranger that sojourns among you, who shall begat children among you, and they shall be unto you as the homeborn among the children of Israel. With you shall they be drawn by lot, an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that in the tribe in which the stranger sojourns, or lives, there shall ye give him his inheritance, says the Lord. So, this is one aspect of, even if somebody's a stranger to the land, and they say, I don't have any inheritance land, I don't think I'm a part of the house of Israel, God has a, a way for them as well. That, that takes me back to Isaiah forty-nine twenty-one, where, where it's saying, when did I get these? Yes. Where did they come oh, beautiful, from? perfect they fitting. They coming over the hills and mm -hmm. not understanding, so that's, that's so beautiful. Thank you, I love that. I oftentimes, when I get little extras like that, I want to immediately fit them into these slides, so I don't want to forget those. So write that down and pass that note off to me, and I'll add it to the study for the next time that we teach it. That's perfect. Then there's prophecies that speak of the highway of holiness that's going to lead the nations to Yeshua, the king and high priest, so that it's an easy path. There's, it says no beast will hurt them. Um, you, know, you don't have to worry about, like the old days, getting robbed along the way. This is called the highway of holiness because the whole purpose of you being on it, it's going to lead you to Jerusalem to learn Torah. Isaiah 40 verse 2 says, Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and cry unto her that her time of suffering is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of yod heh vav -Heh's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of yod heh vav -Heh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is what Yochanan the Immerser was acclaiming um, as he was a... Uh, one preparing the way in the wilderness for Messiah's first coming. But this was actually a millennial prophecy referring to Messiah's second coming that John was using to refer to his first coming as well. Like I said, many prophecies have dual application. So, every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. This is talking about when Jerusalem is raised up and the, all the rest of the land, Arba. So you can see it's a millennial prophecy. John stopped right here 
and he didn't quote this because it was too clear that it wasn't talking about in his day. Just like Yeshua, when he was stood up to read the Haftorah of Isaiah 60, and it pertains to both his first coming and his second coming, Yeshua read down to where it pertained to his first coming, and he didn't finish the Haftorah reading. He didn't go into the second coming. And he sat down after it referred to his first coming, and he says, Today I tell you it has been fulfilled in your hearing. Same way, John, he uses this to quote for preparing the way for Messiah's first coming, but then doesn't go into the millennial prophecy. And he says, um, The glory of yod heh vav -Heh shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Yahavah has spoken. The wilderness and the dry land shall be gladdened, Isaiah 35 uh, says, and the Arabah shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and shouting. For in the wilderness shall waters break forth and torrents in the desert, and the mirage shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation marine life where they lie low shall be grass with reeds and rushes and a highway shall be there so even though there's all this marshland and low land down in the low end you know how around the dead sea there's all these salt pools and marshes and all of these things but there's going to be a highway that you can tread on really clearly so that the masses of the nations can come stream to jerusalem and it shall be called this is the name of the highway the way of holiness so i call it the highway of holiness the unclean shall not pass through it. See, because it's leading up to the temple. You don't go to the temple if you're unclean. But it shall be for these, those that go this way, even fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast go up thereon, nor be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. So that's what its purpose is. It's for the redeemed. And the ransomed of Yahavah shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Imagine how happy the throngs will be going to Jerusalem to learn of his ways. And then there's prophecies of Messiah's throne which is now raised up above everything else. <coughs> having living waters flowing out from underneath it and they're streaming Jerusalem uh, is raised up as you come from the Mediterranean you go up to Jerusalem and once you get on the other side of Jerusalem you drop down drastically to the Dead Sea so literally the waters stream forth both to the east and to the west and this is how it is described in Zechariah 13 and 14. Uh, it says, In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea and half of them towards the hinder sea, both in summer and winter it shall be. So which sea? <coughs> the former sea and the hinder sea, the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Now Yeshua, in John 7, verse 37, at the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, also referred to as Shemini Azaret, the eighth gray assembly, he says, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Referring to the living waters that will flow from him. And Ezekiel describes it even more in detail. He even talks about how the Dead Sea is going to be healed by these living waters, because these living waters are going forth to cleanse and to heal all things. He says, Afterwards, he brought me again to the door of the house in vision, he's speaking, the, the house being the temple. Because remember, this is chapter 47. So here he's been looking at the temple from all these different angles with all these different specific details for the last seven chapters. So he's saying, He brought me again to the door of the house of the temple, and behold, waters issued. Why? Because the throne is in the temple. Waters issued out from underneath the threshold of the house, both eastward, that's towards the Dead Sea, for the forefront of the house stood towards the east, that's the eastern gate. And the waters came down from underneath the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. So remember in the ancient tabernacle, when you entered into the most holy place, from the outer court to the holy place to the most holy place, it was always east, I mean it was always west that you were moving. Because the eastern gate uh, was the way that the rising sun, the pagans would worship the rising sun, so to face God's most holy place, you always had to turn your back on the sun worship. 
And that's the way the, even the Millennial Temple is set up. That's why it's describing the right side. In addition to talking about um, the directions, it's letting you know it's the same layout as the Mosaic Tabernacle. These waters then go out towards the eastern region and down into the Araba, another indication of the Dead Sea, because that's the land around the Dead Sea. Then they go towards the sea, having been made, even though it doesn't ever mention the Dead Sea, I'm showing you how you can extrapolate that this is, it's not only east of Jerusalem, but the land around the Dead Sea is called the Araba to this day. And so here's two indications. Being made to flow into the sea, and the waters of the sea become fresh. Oh, this is a sea where the waters aren't fresh, but there's nothing living there. So, it will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live, and there will be many fish Fish uh, for these waters go there and the others become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. And it will become, and it will come about that fishermen will even go down to the Dead Sea and stand beside it. From En Gedi, and here's a fourth in indication of the Dead Sea, because En Gedi is where I'm going to take some of you uh, when we get there. To Englam, there will be a place for the spreading of nets. So here also, it's showing that people are eating fish during the millennium. Mm -hmm. Some people have tried to say that, but remember, sin and death are not destroyed till the end of the millennium. Sacrifices and you know, fish eating, things like that, will happen during the millennium. Just not in eternity. There'll be no meat eating in eternity. But during the millennium, yes. And then, yeah, it's so beautiful because he even cares about the little things. Even though he's healing the sea, it says, but he's not going to do away with all the salt because salt is used for sacrifices. It's used for preserving food. It's used for flavor. And so he's such a good God. Here he heals the majority of the Dead Sea, but he leaves little pockets of salt. And whoops. It's going to be organic. Yeah. No better fish than those which were bred in the living waters. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Wow, that will be amazing. Talk about heightened omega-3s. I'm huh? from the living waters. That's fish I want to eat. Yeah, it's going to be the best ever. <laughs> yeah. It says their fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the great sea. What sea is that? Mediterranean. So it's, it's telling you, yeah. But its swamps and marshes surrounding will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. By the river on its bank, on one side and on the other, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Remember the one tree that has a trunk on both sides of the river of life? And it bears a different fruit every month. Twelve different fruits. It says that there's a tree even for the healing of the nations. Many people think that that might be the olive tree. Its leaves are very uh, medicinal, very healing. But he'll reveal that in that time. It doesn't name it here. It says um, there will be trees of all different kinds for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because their water flows from the sanctuary and their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. That is beautiful. Imagine constant fruit on those trees and even eat the leaves <laughs> for the healing of the nations. So, there's a hierarchy in the Millennial Kingdom that I like to share with people. Like anything, God is a God of order. And in heaven, there's a certain hierarchy. And so, in the Millennial Kingdom, there's a certain hierarchy as well. Now, we've been told that Israel will judge the nations. And we've taught through Torah what it means to truly judge. What it means to rightly divide the word, right? So he, the, Israel is going to be teaching the nations how to rightly divide Torah because they're closer to Torah. They've been preserving it for thousands of years. But if the wit written Torah has become the living Torah, who is the most ready and apt to teach or impart Torah? Israel or the disciples? The disciples, because they walked with the living Torah, even while the whole nation of Israel might not have recognized him. And so this is why God's light of truth is flowing through Mashiach, through the 12 apostles, one representing each of the tri 12 tribes of Israel. And they sit on 12 thrones with Mashiach, imparting the light of truth to Israel, 
because Israel still has a process to learn during that time as well, the fullness of the Torah in Mashiach. And then the Israel is able to impart what they're learning and what they have known to the nations. So there's this hierarchy of Mashiach and then the 12 apostles and then the nation of Israel and then all of the nations of the world. And so Yeshua was referring to this in Matthew 19, 28 when he said to them, Truly I say to you, you who have followed me in the regeneration, this means after they're resurrected, when the Son of Man shall sit down upon his throne of glory, you shall also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So there's our proof text for that. Zechariah 3 7 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and shall also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Now, Paul, being a rabbi of the highest order, he said, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? He's talking about all of the house of Israel who are saved, they're going to be teaching the world. So there's a reference to that hierarchy. Revelation 3.21 talks about, He who overcomes, to him will I give to sit with me in my throne, as I also have overcome and have sat down with my Father in his throne. So it's very beautiful. Everything flows from the Father through Mashiach, through those closest to him, to the whole house of Israel, and then to the world. That's the order. Now, there's some prophecies that talk about the service in the temple, and the sacrifices, and even David being restored as the prince in Jerusalem. Um, Ezekiel 20, 40 says, For on my holy mountain, on the high mountain of Israel, declares the Lord God, there the whole house of Israel, all of them, will serve me. Isn't that a beautiful reference to the whole house of Israel serving uh, Yeshua, serving Hashem through Yeshua Messiah? In the land, there I will accept them, and there I will seek your contributions. And the last three Torah portions, we've been talking about offerings and contributions. The first t three Torah portions ago, it was the contributions to build the tabernacle. Last week, it was about the offerings for the common man. This week, it's the offerings of the priests. And so, he's going to seek our contributions again. Another indication that the sacrificial system is going to be in practice because like I said before not all of them were pertaining to sin there's many lessons even within if we have any wrong concept of God's character and if even in the slightest iota we think oh well, God you know we don't understand why God acts for the death of animals to represent um, this why so many bulls or why this ram or why this uh, burnt offering or this blood to be splattered this way there might be some question you know is it arbitrary God doesn't want us to think that he's arbitrary at all he has asked very specifically for things to be done because each specific thing in the sacrificial system has pointed to Mashiach and the beautiful plan of salvation through him and so this is what's going to be retaught through the re um re creation or resurgence of the sacrificial system it'll be an opportunity to teach torah more fully so that we can see these things firsthand and understand how there was nothing arbitrary about them all all of it showed elements of his selfless loving character there's prophecies that talk about um yeshua uh, shining the light of Torah. Isaiah 60 says, Arise, shine, speaking to Israel, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen on you, speaking to Israel, in reference to Mashiach. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise on you, and his glory shall be seen on you. And the nations shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your dawning. This is all referencing Mashiach through Israel. Lift up your eyes all around and see. All of them gather themselves together. They come to you. So a beautiful way of saying, you're going to be a light to the world. Mashiach's going to be in the midst of you, and everybody's going to be drawn to this light. And of course, the Torah is the light of Israel through Mashiach that the nations are coming to learn. Isaiah 2.3 says, Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house, the temple again, reference, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. So what this tells you, if you treat it like a um, algebraic equation, if A plus B equals C, 
then C minus B, <laughs> right, leaves you with A. Basically, how can we expect to walk in his paths of righteousness if we do not learn his ways? What this is telling us is we can't help to expect that it's going to miraculously happen that we walk in his ways, even though he has died on the cross for us. And people think that that was the end of everything and that it took care of it all. There's still a work to be done. He still needs to teach us his ways so that we can walk through eternity in his paths. Mm -hmm. The Torah will go from Zion, the word of the Lord, from Jerusalem. Isaiah 54, 13, and Jeremiah 31, uh, 34, and John 6, 45, all speak of the same issue of Messiah reteaching the nat nations from Jerusalem. It says, It is written in the prophets, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. Isn't it beautiful? The Lord himself is our teacher, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Isaiah 56, 8 says, The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel. Here we are, the descendants of the dispersed of Israel, and we're in the process of regathering them together, and ultimately, that is ultimately fulfilled with Mashiach. We're just doing our... Um, his will, you know, we're submitting ourselves to be used. It's kind of like the, the lesser exodus and the greater exodus. The same thing with the dispersion of Israel. Ultimately, they're going to be gathered by Mashiach, but we are going and preparing the hearts like Yochanan. That's what the spirit of Elijah is that precedes Mashiach's coming to unify the whole house of Israel. Coming as a servant and then going on to a son. Yes. Yeah, so beautiful. Because that's that's the responsibility he, for a servant at first. Yeah, that was his example, wasn't it? Yes. He first laid down his life, came as a suffering servant. He who had a name above every name lowered himself to the lowest position. And that's our example. Then was exalted as a son and as a priest and king. Same thing with us. If we will not put ourselves in the place of self-exaltation, but will learn to be a humble servant after Mashiach's model, then we can be raised to the status of a son and priest and king. He says, know you not that you'll be priests and kings with me in my kingdom? So, wow, really good example there. And we see it in him. He, he doesn't expect us to live out anything that we haven't seen him do. Exactly. And so here, the word truly became flesh and made manifest what these principles look like in the life. He gathers the dispersed of Israel, and yet others I will gather to them. So he's gathering the whole house of Israel together. Why? So that we can be a blessing to the nations and people can be grafted into Israel because if we're unified, we're going to be the bride. And if anybody wants to be a part of the bride, we have to first be unified and be living out you know, as a spotless uh, bride without um, spot or blemish as an example to the nations. So he has other people, like he said, I have sheep in other folds. He intends to bring to um, <coughs> eternal life through Israel. And then there's this prophecy in Zephaniah 3.9 that he's going to return everyone to the pure language, Hebrew. He says, then I will turn the people to a pure language that they might all call. This is the purpose of everybody speaking that language so that we know how to truly pronounce this beautiful name that shows, reveals his selfless love when it's said right, to serve him with one consent. And you know what's amazing about this prophecy? Not only is Hebrew the only language that has resurged from a dead language, but the verse preceding it, verse 8, it is the only language in all of the Bible that has all 22 letters in the verse, Zephaniah 3, 8, and it has all five sophit forms, which are the final forms, in the verse preceding it. So when people say, well, how do you know that's the Hebrew language? <laughs> and here God placed the whole alphabet in the verse leading up to this verse. It's really amazing. Yeah. What's your best guess? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then there's prophecies talking about the sun and the moon. And many people say, oh, well, they'll be done away with. We, we're so quick to jump to conclusions when we hear that the light of God and the light of the Lamb um, are the light therein. It's talking about in the city that there'll be no need for the sun in the city because they're brighter than the sun. It doesn't mean that they're done away with. Nowhere does it say because one of the logical conclusions to the sun and the moon still being needed is that he has based them as signs and seasons, oats and moed, for moedim, for appointed times. If we're going to be keeping the holy days during the millennium, and they're based on the observation of the heavenly witnesses as well as the earthly witness. What are the heavenly witnesses? 
sun, moon, and stars, and the earthly witness, the Aviv barley, right? That's how we start our year. He's got to have these things in place during the millennial. So they're not done away with. Zechariah 14.8 says, On that day living waters will flow from Jerusalem. And remember how at the end it said, In summer and in winter. There's still seasons. Seasons are based on the cycles of the sun. So we're just deducing. Little beautiful. See how we turn scripture forward and backwards and we wrestle with it. Because when somebody poses a question like that, you have to be ready with an answer from scripture. You can't just say, well, I think or I've been taught. We have to know the scriptures for these things. So the fact that there's summer and winter seasons shows that there's still the sun shining and the moon uh, after the millennium. Isaiah 66 also refers to the importance of observing the new moon in the millennium. He says, just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, now this is even going further than the millennium, because the new heavens and the new earth is speaking about after the millennium. He says, just as they endure before me, so your offspring and your name will endure, and it shall be from new moon to new moon, and from Shabbat to Shabbat, that all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Then they will go forth, and they will look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me. This time frame is still talking about the millennium, so now it's going, even though it's talking about the new heavens and the new earth there, we know in Hebraic thinking, you can quickly jump from a thought and go back to a previous time frame, and that's the way a lot of uh, scriptures relate. But here the fact is, new moons are important, and Shabbats are important. <coughs> Speaking of the Shabbats, you noticed how this morning I put this uh, scripture in before the Shema. Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. How important do you think this is to God? Right in the heart of the Ten Commandments, he says, Remember this. If you're going to remember anything, as if he knew. The, the God with foresight, the God that knows the end from the beginning, he knew he would forget his holy seventh day. So he says, Remember it. And to guard it, protect it. And here he says it's a sign between me and you throughout your generations. And it comes every seventh day. So what is the definition of a day? One revolution of the earth on its axis in relation to the sun. So the sun has to be in place to determine. Yeah. Isaiah 56, 4 through 6 says, For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. To them I will give in my house and within my walls as a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord's to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath. How do we profane it? Not keeping it holy. How do we not keep it holy? Working, buying and selling, thinking our own thoughts. Remember in Isaiah 58, he says, if you will cease from turning your foot, from doing your own pleasure, thinking your own thoughts and speaking your own words, then see that I won't make you ride on the heights of the earth and feed you with the inheritance of your father Jacob. There's beautiful promises for not doing our own will on his holy day, but seeking his will. And look at how much he teaches us. When we do truly set apart this day, it's amazing what he is just waiting like an excited father. My dad used to wake up in the middle of the night. Isaac, he'd come to my bedroom. Isaac, look at this. He'd been studying and he was so excited. And I never would say, no, I'm tired, dad, because I respected his knowledge so much. I was always excited that dad wanted to show me something. So I was like, yeah, what is it? You know, wiping the sleep out of my eyes. And uh, that's the way I look at our heavenly father too. He's so excited. But he has a certain date, a divine date time that he wants to meet us on and if we show up at another time we're going to miss it there's one day that the shekinah glory comes down and dwells among us and we liken it to the beloved of a bride you know how long we wait for our beloved we sing le Kadodi on shabbat so ezekiel 45 says in the first month in the 14th day now remember anything after chapter 40 so we're talking about the millennium and he's talking about months and days and, of course, the 14th day of the first month is Passover that we're ready to observe here in a couple of days. It says, you shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days, unleavened bread. Now, this is a reference to the millennial reign. So, here in Zechariah 14, we learn we're keeping Sukkot, no doubt about it. So, then people go from thinking, well... I didn't think we were keeping any holy days. I didn't think they were important anymore. I guess I can give you that one. So we'll keep Sukkot 
but they want to just make it that one only, as if God is still not keeping the fullness of his law and as if he's changing. So you have to know the whole of the scriptures to find these different elements. And Ezekiel 45 is where you see the proof text for even Passover being observed in the millennium in case uh, you're ever posed with these questions. And uh, then it goes through everything that you do on Passover. Zechariah 14 uh, is the one that talks about uh, worshiping the king every year. All nations have to come on Sukkot. And um, Isaiah 56 talks about the burnt offerings and sacrifices that we've been studying in the last two Torah portions still continuing in the millennium. He says, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house, my temple, will be called a temple of prayer for all the people. That's beautiful. Ezekiel 44, 11 says, Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house and ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offerings, that's the Ola offering that we read about this morning, and the sacrifices for the people. And they shall stand before them to minister to them. So, if God had it in the past, and He's going to have it in the future, how important do you think it is for us today? Including Shabbats and Holy Days and offerings and People are so quick to do away with anything to do with sacrifices, but we have to understand what was the intent for them. God doesn't delight in the sacrifice of bulls and goats. They're all pointing to the plan of salvation. Ezekiel 45, 17 says, It shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings. So who's the prince? That's what we have to ask. And meat offerings and drink offerings in the feasts. Okay. So we found proof text for Sukkot and Passover. Now it's saying feast plural. And in the new moons. And in the Sabbaths. So here it's correlating the importance of observing new moons. And that's why I wrote a teaching on how to observe the new moon on our website under the blog. Because they're likened to importance with the feasts and the Shabbats. In all solemnities of the house of Israel, he shall prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the boiling pots, these were the pots that were used outside of the altar of burnt offering, in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every boiling pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. They're all being used in the temple service, in other words. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and seat therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Interesting. In other words, what was the Canaanites known for? That hybrid mixture, that uncleanness, that paganism, all three of those elements. So, who is the prince? And we can see that Ezekiel 37 and Ezekiel 34 referred to David as the prince. It says, And they shall dwell in the land I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your forefathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince. So here's the proof text for that. Ezekiel 37:25. Because sometimes it's not so easy to figure these out. Most of the time, Ezekiel just refers to the prince in general, and he leaves it at that. And people have always said, is that Yeshua? Is that David? Who is that? So I try to make it a little more clear. Verse 24 says, The Lord, and I the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David a prince among them. Now, when Mashiach reigns as high priest and king, he is reigning as Mashiach bin David. So is this a symbolic thing? So it takes us back to, you know, is it literal David resurrected? Or is it referring here to Mashiach symbolically as uh, David? David, a prince among them. Now, my servant David. Of course, we're all servants of the Lord. And so there's nothing here to say that it's not literal David, just like here, David. 
And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he will feed them, even my servant David. Okay, well, we know that one shepherd is Messiah Yeshua. So now it takes us back to say, hmm, this looks like it's symbolic language. And these are the things that we wrestle with. Uh, we don't just take one scripture and say, okay, I understand everything. You're constantly looking for other scriptures and comparing them against one another, line upon line, precept upon precept. Even my servant David... Now, is it saying that my servant David is the one shepherd, or is it saying I'll set up one shepherd, Mashiach reference, and he will feed them, and my servant David, he shall feed them, and shall be their shepherd. It seems like it's referring to David as the one shepherd in this text. So there is symbolism to Mashiach bin David. Yeah. And then there's the question about our lives being extended, our lifespans. There's no... Okay. <laughs> Yeshua said in relation to those that have died and are resurrected, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they're as the angels of God in heaven. Now many people have used this as a blanket text to say there's no marriage and intermarriage and no children being born in the millennial kingdom. But that's a supposition. You're adding to it. The question you have to understand in context, he says... This woman has been married to one man, then to a, her, her, his brother when he died, and ultimately to seven men in the resurrection, Rabbi. Who will she be married to? So the question was in reference to if you're dead and you're resurrected, then you're as the angels. You're not marrying and giving in marriage. But there's some people, remember, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain are caught up with them. There's some that have not tasted death. And so there's prophecy. There will be those that are born in the millennium. That's right. So there will be marriage for a certain group, but if you're part of the resurrection group, then no. So that was the difference. We can't make this a blanket statement for all of the millennium. Go ahead. Further, further supporting your, uh, your assertion is uh, Ezekiel 36. Very good. Yeah, yeah and then we're going to see that he who is 100 is thought a young man, and he who doesn't reach 100 is uh, accursed. And we'll talk about what that means. You had something, Victor? Oh, <laughs> just that it said that uh, the leopard shall lie with a lamb, and the uh, child will play by the adder. Yeah, so, there you go. Good so, reference to children. Will die at 100. Yeah. Yeah. So... So that's what I like to share when, because this is the main thing that people use against having any understanding of what's happening in the millennium. You know, there's, um, there's um, <laughs> a thousand years where there can be generations that are growing up learning Torah. Um, Luke 20.35 says, But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, those are those that neither marry nor are given in marriage. So another reference to just the resurrection. Paul said in Hebrews 9.27, It's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And John said in Revelation 26, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Messiah, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And remember, the witnesses in the last days in Jerusalem, even though they go through the full tribulation, three and a half days before Messiah returns, they are martyred, and their bodies lie on the surface of the ground. So even they have taken part. So it says, Blessed is he who takes part of the first death. So don't save your life, because he who saves his life will lose it. Give your life freely for God to use, whether it's as a living witness or whether it's as a martyr. For he who gives his life for my sake, Yeshua said, will gain it. And that's the key thing. Don't worry about the flesh. Focus on feeding the Spirit. So, then we'll look at a couple of texts about those that are alive at His coming without seeing death. Isaiah 65, 19 and 20 says, I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. You know, when we were reading the Dead Sea Scrolls, we actually found a reference to man's life being extended up to the full thousand years. Uh, there was a hidden prophecy in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here it says, He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. So there's still death until after the millennium. Your life is extended because if you're living in closer proximity to the Torah, 
that's what life is, right? Harmony with the source. So what a curse is, is, remember Moses says, if you live out Torah, you'll be blessed. If you don't, what you're doing is you're severing yourself from the source of life. And so what the definition of a curse is, is not God's arbitrary punishment, but that you have killed yourself by severing yourself from the source of life. So even in the millennium, there's freedom of choice. And if the, the Messiah is teaching Torah and somebody chooses to reject it and still live a selfish life for themselves, that's somebody who fails to reach 100 will be considered accursed. Yeah. Because if you live in close proximity to it, you're at 100 and you're thought a mere youth. So see, it's all in direct proportion to understanding this in the context of living in harmony with the source. Bradley had a question? Oh, never mind. When you um, said that um, you killed yourself, it was like suicide. It is suicide. Sin is spiritual suicide. Absolutely. And that's what people should understand. Our Heavenly Father is not imposing rules and restrictions upon us to restrict us from any good thing. He's actually instructing us in the ways of righteousness so that we don't commit spiritual suicide. He's imparting life to us. He's such a loving, merciful God. Good thought, Bradley. So, any questions on this before we move on? Isn't that neat how you can see this? Only if you understand Torah and the source of life can you understand this verse. Otherwise you'd think, oh, that's an interesting verse. I wonder what it's talking about. You don't know when it's talking about. You don't know how, how this could be. But God is revealing beautiful things to us. Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such has no, uh, death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years. We often quote this referring to ourselves as priest, but do we think about what this is saying? <laughs> Blessed is he who has part in the first resurrection. You know, that means fully giving your life. The way Yeshua gave his life, to be a conduit of God's love to man, the same way in the last days we give our life. Um, it's not that we're seeking death, but if God should use it for whatever reason to be a witness, we allow it to be fully used in that way because it's directly referring to those who have taken part of the first resurrection because then they can reign for a thousand years. They're in that glorified body, the Lam Habab. Are those also the ones under the altar? Yeah, yeah, that would be a part of those that are crying out in yeah. the midst of the tribulation saying how much longer and he yeah. says until the rest of your bond servants the same thing has to happen to them in other words. Yeah, exactly. very good point. Uh, verse 5 says, but the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This was the first resurrection. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. It's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Very interesting. So when it talks about Gog and Magog rising up and Satan being loosed for a little time at the end of the millennium, if the rest of the dead, the righteous are raised at the beginning of the millennium, if the rest of the dead are not raised until the end of the millennium, wouldn't it make sense that that symbolic word Gog and Magog are all the wicked through the ages who Yeshua... He died for them also. It's just that they didn't receive it by faith. So if he died for them, didn't he also raise for them? So everybody has a resurrection through the blood of the Lamb. That's the amazing thing. Many people don't think about the wicked having a resurrection because of his sacrifice. They're not raising themselves. It's because his death was truly for everybody. And that's the difference between justification and justification by faith. He justified freely. God was justifying and reconciling the whole world to himself through Yeshua HaMashiach. But not all people will accept it by faith. And that's the difference. If we will accept that justification, that death for ourselves, by faith we enter into then the work of sanctification that makes us holy and ready to be um, drawn near to God. That's the difference from rebellious heart to a willing heart. But he has died for everybody, and so you even see a resurrection for everybody. Daniel puts it another way. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, he says, There will be a resurrection after the time of trouble. Some will be raised to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt. That's another way of putting it. The only difference that he didn't explain in detail was that there's a thousand years between the two resurrections. So I believe that Hasatan, the army that he musters up of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium, is the wicked, when they are resurrected, just like the righteous, when we rise up, our thoughts are on him because that's where they were when we went into the grave. Where's the wicked mind? 
they were always against God. So it's very easy to make them, I want to take that city for myself, or I want, you know, I, I, I. What about and, me? Yeah. And so they rise up with the same angry, rebellious spirit that they went into the grave with. And it's very easy for Satan to muster the captains and kings of men, even, even the people who were a part of all the nations coming against Israel in the Battle of Armageddon. Imagine them. And these men have knowledge in how to lead armies and uh, warfare. And uh, this is when it says the final fire, the final cleansing occurs. Um, because what God is doing is even just there. He's allowing you to see, I didn't arbitrarily choose for them to be eternally separated from me in death. I even raised them up. But look at the mind. No matter how I died for them and how I raised them, they still have the same mindset. The freedom of choice is revealing that no matter what I do for them, they're not going to live in harmony. They're not going to be able to live in my light. Um, and the earth is not going to be able to be cleansed of sin without this um, allowing them to destroy yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. God gave us free choice so that the true nature of man could actually show. That's right. If we didn't have free choice, then we wouldn't be responsible for it. That's, that's right. right. And even the final fire is not an arbitrary act of God's punishment. Mm -hmm. Do you know there's prophecies that talk about Satan and his final destruction? the fire is coming from within himself it's not coming from outside and punishment it's the fire of that sin and anger and rebellious spirit and finally what god has been doing in mercy has been preserving life even to Satan, nobody has life of themselves alone, right? So when you allow, like Romans 1 says, somebody to be given over to the lust of their heart, that means you're fully allowing sin to have its self-destructing effect on it. And the fire comes from within Satan. And I'm not sure if I'll show you that text in this study, or, um, but at least uh, you know it's there. In I, it's, So there's two places that speak of Hasatan. One is Ezekiel 28, and the other is... Isaiah 14, or do I have it reversed? Is it, I think it's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. It's one of those two texts that you can find that in. So at the end of the millennium, this is where we are leading up to, Satan is going to be released for a short time before being destroyed. Revelation says, When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, resurrected wicked, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sands of the seashore. Imagine the wicked throughout all the ages. <laughs> that will be something horrible to see. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence heaven and earth had fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book, this is called the Great White Throne Judgment, at the end of the millennial age. Books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the books according to their works. And all the sea, imagine all the people who've been thrown into the sea, sailing for thousands of years. And all the sea gave up their dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up all the dead which were in them, in the earth. And they were judged, each one, according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. So even after... The, the grave gives up its anything impure anything that had to do with death anything that had an element of sin in the earth that's going to be totally cleansed and eradicated so even death in hades is symbolically thrown into the lake of fire wow. this is the second death even the lake of fire and if anyone was not found written in the book of life he was cast into the lake of fire so that's why each year we say lashana tova tikatevu May your name be inscribed in the book of life for a good year ahead. And we say that every Rosh Hashanah. And how long does Yeshua reign? Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. So he's still submissive. It's so beautiful. He's only doing the will of his Father, even in ruling. It's no self-exaltation. And he gives the kingdom back to the Father. 
when the new Jerusalem descends down from heaven, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. And you know what's amazing? Um, we think of Yeshua having put down all rules and principalities, but Romans 16 verse 20 says, God is a God of peace. Once again, he's revealing the character of God. And he says, the God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet. See, there's a work for us to do in vindicating God's character. Yes, Yeshua lived as an overcomer, but Satan's still roaming about. He is not fully defeated until we put him under our feet by vindicating God's character, living out that selfless love in our lives. So that's why Paul could say, and the God of peace, who does nothing arbitrarily and doesn't even punish, he will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's pretty exciting. That's a high calling for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26 says, For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy being death. death. That's right. At the end of the thousand year millennium, Satan, sin, and death are destroyed, and Yeshua delivers up the kingdom to his Father, God, to reign for all eternity from this earth. And the eighth day assembly at the end of Sukkot, if, if Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, represents the millennium, then what does that one day called the Eighth Day Assembly represent? The beginning of the Eighth Millennium. Why do we rejoice in Torah and dance on the Shemini Atzeret? It's because Torah is going to be fully written upon our heart in that day. And sin is no longer going to reign in our lives. And this, is, this Eighth Day Assembly, every fall, is a, a feast that points to eternity. It points to the Eighth Millennium, after the Seventh Millennium, after the Millennial Reign. Luke 23, 36 says, Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. See, and it's just after the fire of cleansing. So even the symbolic words correlate with what's going to be happening uh, in the future. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. The eighth day assembly is God's prophetic holy day that looks forward to the 8,000th year from creation. At the end of the millennium, when the living Torah has been written on our hearts and we enter into eternity in the presence of the Father without transgressing His law and without any sin and death in our lives anymore. It's the completion of all things. On this day, the Shemini Aseret has two names. Shemini Aseret means the eighth day and Simchat Torah is the other name for it. It means rejoicing in the Torah. It's the day that we conclude and begin anew the annual Torah reading cycle also. So here it's been completed. It's as if we've completed it on our heart, or God has completed it on our heart. An accomplishment that produces unparalleled joy, just like it will in that day when sin is behind us. And so in closing, we look at the heavens, the new heavens and the new earth. When God comes to dwell with us throughout eternity, John saw in vision this new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and earth had passed away and there was no more sea. What's the purpose of sea? To cleanse. When you're living in an unclean world or an unclean body, both our bodies and both the world have 70% water because through evaporation, it's constantly purifying, whether it's the earth or our cellular level. And so this is why there's no more need for huge seas because things are perfect. There's no longer any need for that constant purification. And I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So initially we're a bride for Mashiach, the bridegroom, right? Now at the marriage, what happens? The two become one. So now if we're one with Messiah, this is like a second wedding. The New Jerusalem is coming down adorned as a bride. There's a beautiful union where God's feminine essence, His Shekinah glory that hasn't been able to be fully displayed amongst us because we've been harboring darkness, now that's the true feminine essence of God. Shekinah is the only uh, feminine name for God and it's representing His glory. This is coming down in the New Jerusalem as a bride. So now it's like we're going to be made one, not just with Mashiach, but there's an at one meant to be made with 
God himself. So now the body of Mashiach and the Father, they, as they become one, we're a part of all of that. That's why it refers to now the New Jerusalem being adorned as a bride for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. This is marriage language. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. See, it's this union. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. He that overcomes shall inherit all these things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, the Father says. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was one pearl. And the street of the cities were pure gold as transparent glass. And I saw no temple in that city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple therein. So what is a temple? Our bodies are the temple. When our bodies were too unclean for God to dwell in, what did he do? He set up a model to teach us what he wants for our bodies. That was the tabernacle. After we understand the tabernacle service, we understand the process of sanctification, and we are pure enough for him to dwell in us. And so a temple is some place for the spirit to dwell. Now we're all different elements of his spirit. In that way, we are a cod, even as he is a cod, we are one. So if, if the Lamb and God are together, the temple, what does that mean? It's a place for us to dwell eternally. It's like there's this whole union of selfless love, us in him, him in us. Isn't it beautiful? That's, what a, that's why there's no need for a physical temple, because we're dwelling in him and he's dwelling in us. That's the true temple. And then he says... The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon. It's the city again, not talking about the earth. Or, because in the city, the glory of God lighted it brighter than the sun, and the Lamb is the light therein. So the glory of God, that's the Shekinah, and the light of the Lamb, that's the light of the Word, because the Lamb is the Word made flesh. So you literally see Torah, the masculine, and Shekinah, the feminine essence of God all dwelling and we're in him and he's in us and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day for there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it beautiful I hope that's helped you understand some of these little beautiful intricacies of the millennium that aren't often talked about. Is there any questions that... Uh... A million. <laughs> good, that's a good thing. Yes, Tammy. I, you may have had it up there and I may have missed it and I hope I didn't, but in Zephaniah 3, uh -huh. 18, it says, um, I will give those who grieve about the appointed feast they came from you, O Zion, the reproach of the exiles is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time. Is that talking millennium? Yes. Okay. So the reproach of the nations, we, God intended great things for us from early on, but because of the sin of the whole house of Israel, um, we have taken reproach upon ourselves. We brought it on ourselves, and we lost his protection. So we had to be exiled. But God in his love, even in the midst of that bad experience, we had this reproach, but God used it for good. And you know how? Remember in Revelation it talks about the dragon? He was wroth with the woman, and he went to make war with her seed? We're that seed. And he would have destroyed us if we were all in one place at one time, and so obvious that this is Israel, his bride, his children. So what God has done is actually hidden us, even from the end enemy and it says that he took her to a place on the wings of an eagle interesting that we've been preserved in a place of religious freedom in a land represented by an eagle <laughs> until the until yeshua is going to restore us back to the true land this is a temporary land for protection he hit us in europe he hit us amongst all the nations but we still have a certain reproach upon us until we return to torah we've looked like the heathens we've assimilated we've forgotten our own identity and our purpose everything and so he is going to restore the reproach of uh, the nation of Israel and upon his dispersed uh, in the millennial age. So, so let it be a, um, an uplifting note to know that as we go into like even Passover this time that 
He says, I will turn your shame, your shame into praise, yes. renowned in all the world. And at that time, I will bring you in, even at that time when I gather you together, like we were just talking, and uh, among all the peoples of the earth, and I will restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So yeah, beautiful. So we're here, we know that that millennial is coming, and he has a plan for all of that. that is just Amen. And that's all part and parcel of the good news. When we talk about the good news, it's not just that he died for us. It's that he's living in us, and we can be overcomers even as he's overcome, and we can um, receive. Now we're worthy to receive if we will be overcomers through returning to the ancient paths, through learning Torah, uh, yes. following his ways. Now we're fit for living in the land. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be fit for returning to the land. Why would you even go there if you can't even do step one, two, and three, that type of thing. And so it's so exciting. This is truly uh, the good news. And this is what used to be proclaimed to all the nations. And it's unfortunately good news has gotten a different connotation and gotten watered down. But it, it goes all the way to, and that's why this year at Passover, and I'm glad that you're going to be there because I'm going to introduce the fifth cup. It's not just the cup for Elijah. In um, all the four cups that we observe at um, Passover time, refer to the I wills in Exodus chapter 6. God says, I will sanctify you, or I will save you, I will deliver you, I will restore you, you know, all of these things. And we stop there. But you know, one of the last I wills, it's a messianic I will. And this may be why it's been an inconvenient truth. He says, I will return you to the land. He's talking about returning the whole house of Israel back to the land. I call that the fifth I will. So we're going to have a fifth cup for the looking forward to being restored in the, the land. <laughs> Eretz Yisrael. Yeah. Danny had a question. Okay. <laughs> Got to get them right when they come out. huh? <laughs> You read one or two verses that talked about David, my servant, mm -hmm. in these last days. Uh, do you believe that's literal like it? David will be resurrected and he will be in the kingdom and he will have a place of honor. Um, the question is, when it, what I was trying to reveal there is when we wrestle with scripture, don't just take the pat answer. Every place that says David is not literal David. Sometimes it's talking about the one shepherd. It is referring to Mashiach bin David. So we have to read everything in context. Other places it is talking about David resurrected and he'll have a part even in offering the sacrifices um, and things like that. So every place uh, we have to kind of look at it from all angles and the context of it. And yeah, good question. Well, thank you for your great questions and your patience with uh, <laughs> praise God well let's uh, close with prayer then Tammy would you mind closing us out it'd be an honor to have you pray for us we want to be able to live out everything he's teaching us the burden of my heart is to not have a head knowledge of it alone but to really live it out in every aspect of the life and uh, we've been so blessed in all everything that he's been revealing and yet there's a high calling and I'm I'm just a humble servant you know as he reveals things to me to share them to his children who are also interested in his truth and um, yet there's a high responsibility for us there's a great honor in vindicating our father's character but there's a big responsibility and time is short so let's be intercessors for one another always praying for that in our lives dear lord thank you so much for bringing us together and thank you for these these wonderful truths that are being drawn out yes thank you father lord we we grapple with different things and we ask that you would continue to reveal what is pleasing and and right in your eyes father and thank you for this congregation and mm. the way it's growing and thank you father. for the children and for those that are here today and those that couldn't be with us yes thank you that um isaac has given us a view of the of your truths and that um as he handles them in a humble way we appreciate him being here and his thank sacrifice you, and and for all the the study that he does ahead of time and lord we ask that you would continue to provide health and support for him and his family thank you Father. lord uh, thank you for this sunny day thank you for the provisions and all of the, the love you give us all this we pray in yeshua's name amen oh man thank you